once you can start to see what are the energetics of this room what are the energetics of my tummy what are the energetics of my wife leaving this morning or travel that just brings this whole new vision to everything welcome to commune we are on a mission to inspire heal pass down wisdom and bring the world closer together i've been looking forward to this conversation about ayurveda um because this term can be really confusing for a lot of people me included uh and admittedly i'm somewhat of a neophyte though i've started to make my way through your brilliant course um, and I think one of the reasons why it's confusing is that the word gets used in so many different contexts. Um, it's referred to as a natural healing system. I hear some people refer to it as the spiritual path. Clearly, uh, some people use it as a dietary system or a cooking style or even a lifestyle. <laughs> and um, and a lot of us are left with, well, actually, what is it? So hopefully you can help us untangle um, this concept over the next hour or so. And, and maybe we'd even just start with the word itself um, to give us some grounding and then and then we use that as a springboard. So off to you, no pressure. <laughs> what, does, <laughs> what does Ayurveda mean? Yeah, so this is such a great question to start with. I'm really happy to start here and bear with me as I sort of unravel the layers, yeah? So mm. um, Ayur and Veda, literally translated science of life, you know, so if you go to Google, you'll find the Ayurveda is a 5,000 year old science of life, blah, blah, you know, and it's like, well, what is that? What is the science of life exactly? That's what I thought when I first came to it. And um, mm -hmm. I didn't really quite get it. And then what I could wrap my head around first was, oh, it's a natural healing system. So instead mm -hmm. of using, you know, um, x-rays and labs, you're using pulse and tongue and other such diagnostic modalities. And instead of using drugs, you're using herbs and things. That was my next sort of level of understanding of it, which is really still just scratching the surface. So once I sort of progressed and progressed and progressed into the, the richness <laughs> of, of what it is, the best way I can describe it is it's an awareness of energetics of everything. So literally it's like, imagine the world was black and white and then all of a sudden you could see color. It's like a whole new layer of awareness you have of color, right? Um, it's similar in that there everything that's surrounding us and we ourselves are really just energy. And so once you can start to see what are the energetics of this room? What are the energetics of my tummy? What are the energetics of um, my wife leaving this morning or travel? Um, that just brings this whole new vision to everything because then you're operating in another dimension right? So you're not looking at the menu and saying, oh, what am I going to eat today? How many carbs? How many fats? You know, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman told me this, like this other uh, health influencer told me this, and I'm trying to reconcile it all. And I'm trying to figure out what's the right thing to do up here. Instead, we can really tap into what are the energetics that are, are happening in my digestive system today and what are the energetics of these foods and what are the energetics of this moment and navigate that decision with that whole new layer of awareness, right? So simply stated, I could say Ayurveda is an energetic mapping system. But then why are we mapping energetics? We're mapping energetics to be able to guide our choices, right? So we know 
well, what asana practice is good for me today? What music is good for me today? What aromatherapy, what food, what routine? How should I navigate the energetics of my life in a way that is going to allow me to feel best, right? And so if you're making decisions in a way that really allows you to feel best, that's empowerment, right? So I would even push the boundary, and I think I'm the only one to be saying this, but to me, Ayurveda is a system of self-empowerment. And that's something I really didn't find in all of the other natural sort of healing systems, right? Like it, it, for you to have a whole new layer of awareness and ability to navigate your micro to macro decisions with that awareness, I feel is something that's unique to Ayurveda and really what drew me to it, right? Then if you're going through life and you're living in this way, which is not how most of us are living, right? Where you're just attending to the energetics and and making your choices accordingly, then it really does become a lifestyle, right? So I think what has happened with Western mass marketing, with uh, colonialization of India, Ayurveda going under down, and we can, we can go into more of these things later, uh, with even patriarchy and, and the um, sort of emphasis on science and experts and authority uh, versus... Um, internal awareness, um, guiding decision-making. I think all of those factors really came in to bring Ayurveda out in a very allopathicized rule-based context. So it almost seems like this type yourself, live this way, type yourself, eat this thing. You know, here's all these rules for this dosha. Here's all these rules for this dosha. And I think it leaves everybody feeling like, oh, that's kind of cool, but I, I don't, know where to start and overall all these rules uh, is overwhelming and then we don't really use it and it just becomes something that oh i i learned about that in a cleanse or i got a spa treatment with that or you know i bought a cookbook once okay this is so interesting <laughs> um, because it's really pulling at something that i've been thinking a tremendous amount about and i, I don't want to take us uh, off the path of specifically Ayurveda, but I think what you're speaking to this Westernization of an Eastern practice speaks to two very different ways that we understand the world and the foundational intelligence of the universe. So the Western paradigm which is codified in Abrahamic religions and then subsequently in the empiricism of science, sees the world as something that is made. Like literally in the book of Genesis, God picks up a clay figurine and breathes life into Adam's nostril. And life is something that is created and made and we can understand it by dissecting its component parts and putting it back together again. And if you look at traditions like Taoism or Buddhism, for example, there is much more of a feeling or a sensation that the world and life emerges uh, spontaneously moment to moment as an organism functioning in and of itself. And it is not something that is made. It is something that is constantly emerging and evolving moment to moment. And obviously those traditions also teach us a lot about self-awareness. So there seems to be this merging of the awareness of what is emerging moment to moment in your own eco in the ecosystem of your own body and um you know when i uh was researching you and your work um it's uh, i wrote down a number of different words one was agency um i think well, the other was self-empowerment <laughs> and um what else did i write and self-knowledge and you know, obviously, Western allopathic medicine, for all of its benefits, um, does not seem to a focus on in on the individual, 
on what makes it unique and what it's like to be you and what it's like to be me. It looks at ep epidemiological studies and symptoms and then just, uh, you know, prescribes, you know, particular pharmaceuticals for particular systems or for particular symptoms, excuse me. Um, but Ayurveda is, seems to me to be tapping into one's own individual intuition around what is emerging in their own body moment to moment. And you have this incredibly interesting biography. Um, and because you are, uh, you got your BA in neuroscience, your MD uh, from Cornell, a master's degree in public health from Berkeley. I mean, you are seriously anchored in Western medicine. You're not just coming at Ayurveda because you thought it was interesting in a yoga class, although that may be true too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I maybe uh, uh, it would be interesting to pick apart your biography a little bit and you know what eventually led you to Ayurveda uh, perhaps kind of in contrast to what you had spent uh, a lot of your life learning, um, you know, steeping yourself in Western medicine. Yes. And I mean, even before that, I love what you just did there in terms of like really going back to some of the creational stories and these roots of like fluidity versus one way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. But, and I think that is at the core of the difference between um, allopathic and Ayurveda, really. It's this understanding that we are an expression of the natural universe. We're all made up of the same thing the universe is made up of. And there's a connectivity there and there's a uniqueness to my particular expression of energy and your particular expression of energy. And the idea is, well, let's get to know the patterns and the movements and the expression well enough to attend to them in a way where really the ultimate goal is to feel, feel damn good in life. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I like, that's the true goal of Ayurveda. And so I think that's where touching on even your initial reference of it, it being a spiritual path, you know, in, as, as a path of self-realization, right. As a path of, um, understanding lowercase self as a part of the uppercase self of the greater Brahmana and the greater universe and the connectedness with the divine and everything, which isn't really allowed for in some of those other models and systems. And that really is what drew, drew me, I think, to Ayurveda from those systems, because in neuroscience, it was really the mind body connection that fascinated me and decision making fascinated me. My thesis was even on like gender dis, um, differences in decision making hmm. and just wondering like, why do we choose what we choose? Um, that was interesting to me. And naturally I was so fascinated with the brain and the mind that I thought I would go into neurology. Uh, it just, that's what you do from neuroscience, right? And uh, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor, like even in the five-year-old home videos, I always knew my path was in medicine and healing. So I, I didn't really take much time to question it. I just went straight through to med school. And um, in medical school, I felt like that limitation of those the structure that we were just referring to, you know, because there isn't an opportunity to get to know the whole context and picture and really attend to it or the history and the patterns. There's, there's no opportunity there. It's really just a, a very limited, almost like I used to feel like Ayurveda would allow me to hear the whole song, but in Western medicine, I could only just get like three notes. Exactly. Yeah. That's a beautiful metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, functional medicine starts to get at, you know, examining some of the root causes 
of disease, for example. Um, but, you know, so often in Western allopathic medicine, we have, um, we have atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease, and you just prescribe a statin and, you know, that takes down your LDL and your endogenous production of, of low density lipoprotein. And there you go, you know. Oh, that's uh, such a great example. Can I, can I yeah, run with pull that? On that? Sure. So, you know, functional medicine, by the way, just as a side note, has roots in Ayurveda because Deepak Chopra helped to develop the specialty. And so that's why I think it has a little bit of that infused into it. But let's take even, I think this is a good way for listeners to understand what I'm saying about the whole song and the, and the notes. So that example you just gave of CAD and, okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to externally or exogenously bring in something to modify or modulate or to halt a process that is happening internally without really understanding why the process is happening internally, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. in so many of our uh, diagnoses in the Western world, we only have symptoms that are associated or correlated, but we don't have elucidated clearly a causative pathway and there are multiple competing theories. So let's take with like um, buildup of cholesterol in the arteries and taking a statin and or saying, okay, now you can't eat any cholesterol, right? Well, actually, interestingly, the most prevalent um, sort of theory about why do we build up cholesterol in the first place is microthelial tear theory, which means that there's little micro tears happening on the inside of the artery and that's signaling to the body hey there's some patchwork that's needed mm -hmm. here and then the cholesterol is the coating of every one of our cells it's it's in like indispensable we cannot repair tissue without cholesterol right so then the cholesterol goes and it patches. Now, Ayurveda really understood this because they would look at it and they would look at the patterns of someone's life and they would say like, for example, oh, you have too much depletion and you have too much inflammation and these patterns have been going on for a long time. And the result on this is that imagine you had a blow dryer on your tongue. You know, you're going to have very hot, dry, cracked sort of insides of your arteries and naturally your body's trying to repair that. So, let's help the body do that. And we will douse you with ghee, which is loaded in cholesterol. <laughs> mm. And we will calm down the depletion and nourish the heck out of you. And we will attend to the inflammation. And we will try to turn off that internal signaling to let's produce cholesterol and let's transport it in the blood and let's start patching it everywhere. Right. And that's, let's compare and contrast those two approaches. Like, wow, like in one, you're going to be dependent on that statin for the rest of your life because the signal has been turned on by the liver to make cholesterol and to send it to tissues that need repair. Two, I've just blocked one of your most powerful ways to repair tissues. And three, I haven't changed the fact that the insides of your arteries look not very good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel that, um, well, it's funny, functional medicine almost feels like, uh, you know, when I was a little boy, I would ask my parents why all the time. And then you just, and they're like, well, eat your vegetables. But, but why? Well, because uh, they have, they're nutritious. And I'm like, but why? You know, you just keep asking why. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, Ayurveda is similar, but it's almost like feeling why. Uh, you know, instead of asking why all the time, you know, really honing in on your own I intuition around feeling. Um, it, because, for example, you know, as you point out in that particular um, example of, of coronary artery disease, that irritation of the endothelial, which then actually 
um, sends a signal for LDL, which is actually an antioxidant to start with before it, it becomes more of a villain in the, in the caper. Um, y- you know, there is a reason why your arterial walls would be uh, inflamed or irritated or pocked. And so, you know, and so I'm, I guess I'll ask the question, is there, how does one develop the self-knowledge or the intuition to be able to become more aware of themselves and say, ah, okay, there's inflammation arising in my system. And in order to counterbalance that, I need to do this. Yeah, well, I'd like to really just say for a moment, it's not an intuitive only thing. Like, really, it's a very sophisticated medical science, one that blows my mind and one that is so far beyond allopathic medicine, truly. And so the diagnostic and and if you go to Ayurveda, anything in India right now, it's like there is nothing spiritual, intuitive, or woo-woo about it. It's super scientific because I think they're trying to prove to the Western world and because after the, the colonialization, it resurfaced in this Western context in, in Britical, British medical institutions, right? So it is really truly a science and a beautiful one the way I've presented it. And so maybe, you know, I'm leading you in that direction too, as your, your real exposure is, is a lot um, with the course is, is this way of truly feeling and self-assessing because it can very much be a cerebral thing, right? So we can break down charts and say, here are all of these possible signs of inflammation in the body and how many of them do you have? And that gives us a very clear yield to the degree of inflammation in your body. And that is a diagnostic sort of proxy, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Over time, I encourage my clients, my students to put those charts down and to feel it because we are made to sense energy. We have all these sense organs and there's more than just the five that we commonly talk about. And so our brains are biased and they are caught up with so many other shoulds and confounding factors. But if we really get adept at feeling, that will never lie to you. Right. So I think we all do sort of come into this practice of seeing the energetics of what's happening within us and around us through a more cerebral, scientific codification sort of process. Oh, that's vata, that's pitta, that's kapha. Oh, that's a combination of this. And then I like to encourage people to slowly, slowly come into the more intuitive approach. But the problem is, is that Jeff, frankly, people don't feel very well these days. Yeah. It's a practice in and of itself, right? Yeah. And um, I think I'd like to explore some of the ways that people can cultivate uh, a a better ability to feel. Um, But I think maybe let's step back for a moment and um, because Ayurveda is going to be very new to many, many people. And um, I think they'd be well served if we spent a little bit of time talking about some of the core elements, if you can muster the stamina <laughs> uh, to talk about them. But literally the the five core elements that make up all of energetic patterns in the universe and then maybe go into sort of the coincidence of opposites that emerge within nature as codified by the gunas and, and then maybe into the koshas just to provide some general organizing principle for the conversation. Ooh. Okay. Um, (laughs) here we go. Well, here we go. Let's see. I think if I were talking to somebody brand new and they were like, how do I do this? Siva, you know, how do I start, applying the science to my well-being. 
um, I would take the definition of the energy mapping system. I'd say, okay, well, first things first, we have to develop this ability to sense energy and map it, right? And therein comes the energy categorization system. So, you know, we have to remember that the ancient sages were operating at a time when people lived in nature. And not to say that, oh, the five elements is the only way to categorize things. It, there are other ways. And if you look at all these other ancient cultures and healing systems, they're doing essentially the same thing in slightly different categorization. But I think it made a lot of sense for them to describe the world in the five elements because people lived in nature in close relationship with the five elements so i think if you talk to someone from long long time ago and you ask them about water and they're living next to a riverbank they have such a rich way to describe the qualities of water and today if you go to somebody in modern times and you say talk to me about water you know they're like what you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> they kind of, you know, they're not with that deep relationship with the five elements, right? And so I almost discourage people from even going there these days because we don't have that relationship and it just ends up feeling really abstract. So I personally guide people to say, okay, if we're going to do energy mapping, let's go straight to the three doshas, which are what eventually anyways the categorization is reduced down to so for people who are totally brand new we're categorizing energy energy of anything and everything because everything is energy and originally the sages did that with saying we can break everything down into the five elements and then we can further break them down into three primary energy types and that's literally what dosha it, it's a it's an, a causative energy, right? So these are ones that we probably heard of and where people try to get you to type yourself as. So it's the vata, the pitta, and the kapha. And um, I definitely go into this more in the course, but the short version is, look, everything in the natural universe has to be created, built, assembled, grown. <laughs> it has some function, purpose, um, transformation or work that it does. And then it is degenerated, disassembled and, or, you know, um, uh, disseminated dies. Right. Yeah. And so it makes sense that the three primary energies are really that this energy of creation, kapha, this energy of sustenance and, and purpose and doing kapitta and the energy of the disassembly, so to speak, uh, vata, right? And it, again, our relationship with these three doshas develops over time. It, you know, when I first started learning about this, I was like, oh, pitta hot, pitta fire hot, pitta fire hot, you know, pitta fire inflammation. <laughs> and, you know, it's only after time that I could understand it also is like what allows me to digest information and what um, feels like intensity in my day sometimes and what feels like um, an irritation with my children maybe, right? Like, so to be able to identify the energy, the way I guide people to do that is through the qualities. I think you mentioned the word gunas. So there's the gunas that are talking about consciousness, that's rajasattva tamas. And then there's the gunas in the physical plane, which is what we're referring to, which are the physical qualities, right? So again, in Ayurveda back then, they kind of broke it down into these sort of 20 odd main things like wet, dry, hot, cold, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the course, I, I use a lot of other words that I think are a little more relatable because people don't necessarily think of like dispersing <laughs> as a term that they are thinking of in their lives maybe, right? Um, so 
if you can start to identify the presence of equality, which everyone can do because we can all sense, right? I know when the conversation is dry. I know when my hair is dry. You know, it's okay. I can feel dryness. If dryness is a quality of vata energy, then I know that energy must be present, right? So that's probably the best way that I can recommend for people to come into this practice of starting to sense the energies um, within their bodies, within their emotional bodies, within their minds, within their lives, right? And then we get to do sort of this matchy matchy because um, you brought in the opposite. So let's talk about that for a moment. So it's a very simple, like grandmother wisdom sort of premise that opposite qualities balance each other, right? So I really see all of the world on a spectrum of quality now because of Ayurveda. And I understand that It's not that you need to be this way or that way. It's when you come too far this way and you get the signals for that, then you take a few, you know, steps back this way until those signals resolve, AKA signs and symptoms in the body, right? So if I'm feeling too hot, well, maybe I'll have a cool glass of water. Maybe I'll turn on the AC. Maybe I'll take a rest and, and then, I'm not feeling hot anymore. And the signals are letting me know, okay, you've kind of come back to a homeostatic sort of balanced place. And that's, that's really what we mean when we say balance in Ayurveda. And it's really what we're aiming for is we're aiming to constantly kind of watch where our energetics are at, be attentive to the signals from our own being (laughs) about where we are at make adjustments to sort of come back to this homeostatic place until the signals resolve, which is the confirmation. Did I answer it? Yes, very, very well. Um, Okay, good. For me, who is uh, steeped in Taoism right now um, and trying to live um, with the water's course or in harmony with the Tao, which is essentially that the logos, the foundational intelligence of nature, brings together, op- brings opposites together into coherence. And um, so this is a big part of the way I'm trying to live my life right now is to constantly be able to identify when something becomes extreme and then be able to balance it such that I'm great creating greater coherence into my that's life. That's Ayurveda. And that can be applied to <laughs> politics, <laughs> though we don't have to apply it to politics here, but um, mm-hmm. it can be applied to a whole variety of, of aspects of life. Um, and in a way, m- modern Western culture is designed to meet like with more like instead of like with its opposite to find balance. Um, But that's a whole other discussion about how life has become other extreme. Yeah, yeah, but that's exactly why Ayurveda is a lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Because it it is that awareness of where am I at and what do I need? That This is like my Mm -hmm. tagline that's in every one of my courses. And whenever (laughs) I teach, I try to drill it into people. It's the practice of where am I at? What do I need? And that happens in marriage. That happens in political beliefs. That happens in parenting. That happens in career. That happens in everything, right? In the course, we really focus on wellness and the body and being able to understand the signals and interpret them that your body is giving you so that you can understand where you are at and you learn this language and you learn to be able to sense the energies in your body. And then a beginning um, sort of understanding of what do I need based on where I'm at the response to the assessment. Right. And Mm -hmm. just sort of some basics on that, but you know, outside of the course, this, this is infused like I told you about seeing your life in Technicolor, now I cannot not see the energetics in a conversation, in a in a season, in a vacation, in everything. 
And are you born with the equivalent of a DNA nucleotide sequence um, in terms of your energetics? You know, for example, so you can exist across this spectrum of the koshas and have sort of mix uh, of different energetics. But are you born with a kind of stable composition a and then and then from that core base you experience different balances and imbalances? Ooh, I love this question. That's a good one. Okay, okay. so um, here's the thing. We do sort of have the genetics or the constitution, right? And this is the energetics of where the egg was at and where the sperm was at when you were conceived combined. So yes, there's mom and dad's DNA in there, but the energetics of that also infused with the energetics of the pregnancy and the birth process. So that sort of patty cake produces the pie of you, right? <laughs> and <laughs> that's your foundation. However, we have a lot of genetic material and how it is expressed, as you can see with siblings, like siblings from the same parents that have the same technical genetic makeup and how differently it's expressed, no? And it's not just the difference of, um, you know, oh, it, mom was older. No, it's, it's really, if you start to look at the qualities, like, for example, my younger sister has so much more uh, kapha in her constitution because my parents were in such a settled, grounded, or uh, like all kind of chunky and abundant by that time of their lives, as opposed to when they had me and they were you know just scraping by as immigrants. And it was a very different energetic that went into me. But not only did the energetics determine sort of the difference between my sister and I and in, in how we have come out in our little energy balls, but we continue to take in energy. Our, our whole lives is just absorbing the energy of our lives and taking it in and literally making ourselves up of it. And so therein comes the whole field of epigenetics because, um, and Ayurveda definitely, we believe that the energetics of your life can influence what, what is expressed and how and when and to what degree. And so this brings me to the concept of current state, which is different from constitution. And I think it's really important for new people to understand this. And this is why in the course and in general, I really discourage people from doing a constitution analysis. I, I really think it's irrelevant and because it's not your first step at all. If I'm going to say, hey, Jeff, let's heal you or let's make you feel better today. It's going to all be based on what your energetics are today. And that may not be relevant for how you were made. <laughs> really, I'm not treating how you were made. I'm treating where you're at and what you need, right? So m where I diverge from traditional Ayurveda and, you know, some of my teachers aren't very fond of this, but uh, my little rebellion is to say, look, put that down, focus on where you're at today. Let's attend to that. And if you can have that as your daily practice, that's enough. Then over time, as you deepen your practice of energetic awareness of your own patterns and who you are and how you operate and how to best set your life up to attend to that, then the greater context of your constitution comes into play and it's fun and it's helpful, but it's really not necessary to live an Ayurvedic lifestyle. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Um, of course, the Buddhists said a lot about impermanence and this notion that there is no stable self. And uh, a lot of that was addressing kind of human consciousness and psychology. But even if we look at physiology, there is nothing stable about what it's like to be Jeff moment to moment. I have, I'm a, I'm a wash in 
neurotransmitters, dopamine, and then acetylcholine, and then someone slams the door and a spike of epinephrine, and then I have something to eat, and then there's some serotonin in there, and <laughs> you know, all the blood is going to my stomach and away from my heart, and you know, my breath rate's going down, but then something else happens and my heart rate goes up, and you know, it's just like I am. Um, there's nothing stable or permanent about what it is like to be alive. And, you know, we kind of fool ourselves that there is a stable, reliable self because one moment seems so much like the last moment. So we have this sense of psychological and physiological continuity to life. But reality is we are just in a constant state of impermanence and motion, and we are just spontaneously emerging moment to moment. So, you know, but doesn't to- that leave you feeling so overwhelmed? Because then it's like, well, what do I, what, what do I do? And I, I, I love your like physiology. You know, geeking out. I think that's so <laughs> awesome. But this is exactly what I found so challenging, and is the the common language and platform to be able to view how all of my life is affecting me is not there in functional medicine or physiology, right? Like, so how is what's happening in my day and in my marriage and with my children and in my food and in my work and in the weather and in the seasons all related? And I I can't describe all of that in the neurotransmitters. And it leaves me at a loss to really get a sense of the the big picture and how I should be navigating my life choices. Whereas with Ayurveda, because I can view all of those things in the same language mm. and understand the energetics of how all of this is coming in and my body is showing me how it's digest digesting it or you know <laughs> taking it in it gives me clarity on how to make the micro choices and the macro choices. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I I think of um, sort of dependent origination or these notions of mutual interdependence as, um, as made physical by the, the image of Indra's net, for example, this kind of ever expanding web of, uh, of existence in which each juncture there is a bead of water that reflects every other bead and it is impossible to <laughs> you know it's impossible That's a great image. yeah it's impossible to cognitively dissect the reflections of every single other bead so bringing that back into reality here um all of the inputs environmental uh, et cetera, that are are influencing what it is like to be me or what it's like to be you moment to moment, those are impossible to cognitively discern. <laughs> and so um, so we need systems and understandings um, in order uh, to be able to find a place of homeostasis, of of balance of living in accordance with nature. Um, and, um, and then, you know, this is obviously, I'm very new to, to, to this science, but I'm, as you can tell, I'm fascinated by it because, um, as I try to understand how everything that emerges is dependent on everything else, you know, what am I, what am I to do? (laughs) And, um, and, and so, you know, maybe we can use some sort of specific grounding examples um, for people because inevitably, you know, quotidian life is full of the 10,000 things and logistics that can elicit certain kinds of sensations and feelings, some of which can be, you know, very uncomfortable. So, you know, like, let's say travel for me. And I, 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 I picked that one because I have a lot of anxiety around travel. You know, I like to be very stable and, and, you know, I love my home. I love my routines, et cetera. So when I'm having to like 
hustle all my estrogen footprint, which is my loving name for my family because I have three daughters. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I have to hustle this footprint, you know, into a car, into the airport, uh, you know, you know, bags and planes and trains and automobiles. I tend to uh, get anxious and a, and a little bit nauseous. Um, and, uh, and I wonder, so with other people that may have a similar um, impulse or reaction to travel and the anxiety associated with travel, maybe we'll just use that as an example. How do you, um, yeah, how do you meet that's that an, where it is? That's a good one. And we're all, we all do a lot of travel and movement. So I think a lot of people can relate to this example now. So if we're looking at any balancing um, goal or intention, it's just going to be the same process over and over again. So we're going to look at what are the energetics that are surrounding the experience or inherent in the experience, and what are the energetics that are be revealed by the person that we're trying to attend to, right? So the energetics of travel are all vata. So transition, movement, um, unfamiliar, stimulation, change, um, even especially flying, like we're in the air, it's so cold and dry. Mm -hmm. um, these are all qualities of vata. And so travel is like a vata bomb that we take in, right? And so just using that opposite sort of thing, we're like, okay, well, we need to counter some of those energetics as much as possible, right? So um, some very generic tips, not talking specifically about you, would be we need to bring in the opposite quality. So as much as we can, you know, bring in the opposite of literally all the adjectives that I just mentioned, right? So some destimulation, some familiarity, some ease, space, time, um, warmth, moisture, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be things that counter that, right? So this is just like super surface level, look at the qualities, bring in the opposite qualities. That's always going to be balancing kind of approach. But then we can get a little more dialed in too and say, okay, well, what are the effects of Vata on the nervous system? Well, anxiety, um, overwhelm, distractibility, trouble focusing, fear, worry, um, trouble sleeping well. And a lot of people experience these effects in the mind and nervous system. Okay, well, what are the effects in the digestive system? Well, the digestive system is a warm, moist, super rhythmic kind of system. It doesn't like any of that. So basically when you bring all of that in, um, you see a lot of gas, bloating, constipation, loss of a true physical appetite, loss of a really good digestive capacity, the ability to break down and absorb food. Um, and um, sometimes even a paresis, like, a, uh, like it just kind of stops working, you know, yeah, because if the yeah. sympathetic nervous system is on, you're not in your parasympathetic, which is the rest and digress. And so it kind of like says, stop. <laughs> if yep. you will, right? Yep. So the nervous system and digestive obviously interplay there. And then we could look at like, let's say skin, right? And up, oftentimes you'll see people get really dry. You get the idea. So you can kind of go on a systems level and you can understand the effects of this energetic on that system. And then you can bring in more specific counters, right? So, okay, can we bring in practices, herbs, foods that are going to decrease vata in the mind and nervous system, support digestive capacity, um, and uh, reduce some of those signs and symptoms. And absolutely. So for me personally, when I travel, I have some specific practices that I do. I always give a huge buffer time to the airport. So I don't have any of that anxiety about like missing 
anything. And that allows me to turn off that whole like, oh my God, something bad's going to happen if I don't blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing that I do is I always give a buffer day when I arrive anywhere, including when I arrive back home so that I know I have time to sort of like ground and reclaim my practices because naturally Vata is a very dispersing, erratic, unpredictable kind of force. And so it's very common to fall off of our routines and our habits when we travel. So I give myself that buffer time. I always travel with an empty thermos and I go to the, you know, cafe in the airport and have them fill it with a hot water. I usually will bring a digestive tea or powder or fresh sliced ginger in there to improve my digestive capacity. Usually on days that I travel, I only eat soup and broths and very warm things, which is not really what they serve at the airport. So um, I know in every airport where I can get my soup, <laughs> which place. <laughs> and uh, it's like this, like, you know, you kind of have to just work it out. I oil my ears and my nose with castor oil beforehand. I always bring noise canceling headphones and play like Schumann's Resonance or something that's going to ground. I do Brahmari Pranayam while I'm waiting for takeoff. I oil my feet. I bring an extra pair of socks. I make sure I have a blanket. I take a warm bath when I arrive if possible or the night before I leave. If I really want to get fancy, I might even do an oil enema if I'm like flying to India and it's like a 27 hour flight. So do you see like it's all of these little tips are not rules and it's not like everybody needs to do these things, but these are ways to bring in those opposite balancing qualities and the ways we can bring in opposite balancing qualities are infinite. You can get very creative, but this is just an example. Yeah, that was great. Uh, just out of curiosity, are you kind of naturally a kapha energy? No. <laughs> no, no, and so thank you for that compliment. <laughs> well, because I, I, I ask because you basically this ritual that you described, at least the first half of it, and then uh, you lost me at oil enema, but um, was <laughs> you, was exactly what I do. Um, and, I tend uh, to be very vata imbalanced, and those were all vata imbalancing tips. And the reason you do it. them, Jeff, is because what you have done is studied yourself. Mm, yeah. And so you have paid attention to what works for me, what feels better to me. And you hold on to those. And you obviously have a lot of vata in your constitution. I can see this in your bone structure and such. And even in your like, ooh, I want to learn about everything. What's this <laughs> and what's that? You know, yeah. you also have a lot of pitta going on. And so that might also play into something because it's never just in a silo. And I think that's an important point to make. It's never like, oh, we're just dealing with vata or pitta or kapha. It's everything is fluid. It's just a categorization system. But think about the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. We categorize millions of shades in these three primary colors but it's very rare to have pure blue yellow or what but we still find families we find patterns and we work with it right it's the same in ayurveda with vata pitta kapha yeah i think that's really a great point that we exist across this spectrum and that the energetics within that, within that spectrum are mutable they're malleable um and i'm also laughing a little bit because my wife left for Kauai on a women's trip, girls, you know, friends trip this morning. And she leaves with the absolute minimal time because she doesn't want to spend even one minute extra in the airport. And so I, I, this has been a tug of war in our relationship for 34 years. I always want to leave like three hours early. She wants to leave like 45 minutes early. Anyways, but when she goes by herself, she can leave whenever she wants. Um, so maybe we could address another uh, energetic. And um, we're in February, at least when we're doing this interview. And a lot of North America, um, where we live, is cold. Um, obviously, we live in Southern California, so we're a little bit... Um, 
you know, outside of the, the normal temperature. But what, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, in this time of the year, like, how do I address feelings of lethargy? I can't get out of bed. I seem to be procrastinating all the time. Um, and maybe you could uh, dissect that a little bit in the same way that you dissected the travel conundrum. Yeah, sure. So what we have in, in the fall when it starts to get cold and windy and, and there's like a dry cold, right? And then as we come through the winter and start coming into the spring, it's more of a damp cold. So that's basically the transition from Vata into Kapha season, if you will. But we've just gone through so much cold. We're really cold, like deeply now for people that live in really cold climates. And depletion is a part of that too, right? And so you're already cold, you're depleted, and now comes a heavy damp on top of that. And you're like, ooh, you're like <laughs> trying to move through that. And it's everybody can relate to this because when you have a bright morning, the sun is shining, it's hot outside, you're so much more motivated to get out of bed than when it's like super gray and rainy and cold, just you just want to stay in the covers. It's the natural effect of those energetics, right? So it's definitely the same approach that we just did where, okay, we're going to take these qualities of stagnation, of cold, of dampness, of um, depletion, and we're going to just bring in the opposite qualities, right? So we need um, things that strip away accumulation and stagnation. We need things that warm it up for sure. Uh, we need things that nourish on a soul sort of level, right? And that kind of stimulate, if you will, right? And now again, we could play that little game of like, how many ways can you think to bring in those qualities, right? So really spicy food is good, bringing in herbs that are, for example, circulatory stimulants or nervine stimulants that kind of get, get you motivated and going, which is why so many people reach for caffeine, right? Because it, it falls in that category. Um, having a lot of warmth in other ways too. So the warm and moist is really good. So the um, bath, let's say, but then also we want to strip away accumulation and stagnation. So more like if I add a bunch of Epsom salts in there and I'm actually detoxing, and then if I add in a bunch of essential oils that are warming and stimulating or like fresh eucalyptus or whatever, like, you know, it's like every little micro choice you can head toward those qualities. So what we want to avoid would be foods that are cold, like ice drinks, like ice cream, um, raw foods, think salad, foods that don't have a lot of nutritional value, the munchy munchy stuff, really all that crispy, crunchy, cracky stuff is not helping anything. And then all of the really heavy stuff isn't helping anything too. So something like mashed potatoes or thick oatmeal, or, you know, that's just like, more of the same qualities, right? So you want to lean towards the broths and the, you know, um, really like the greens and the bitter greens are what kind of strip away accumulation. And then the spices, you know, it doesn't have to be super spicy, pungent, hot, but even just culinary spices and to your own taste of what you can take as heating and warming these are just simple, simple things, right? And then also to sweat. So this is the time of year for sauna. And this is the time of year to really kick it up with cardio. And, you know, um, it's a time where the counter is also to clear out the accumulation. So this is where spring cleaning comes from. It's a time to kind of take stock of like, what's weighing me down? What's you know, creating heaviness and stagnation accumulation and kind of getting rid of it. So this is a great time of year for detoxes, um, cleanses in the body, and then also for the home. So just to give you a few ideas of, okay, this is just basic, looking at the energetics that are present, setting the intention to bring in the healing qualities, and then brainstorming creative ways that we can bring in those. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the relationship between yoga 
and Ayurveda. Now, I, as I was doing a little bit of research, I was in the Upanishads and I, I actually was reading a little bit about Ayurveda in the Bhagavad Gita itself. So, as you mentioned, this is a, a science that goes back millennia. Um, and obviously, the other science, if you will, that goes back and is very parallel to Ayurveda is, is yoga. So, what is the relationship between the two? Is there overlap? What are the differences? Um, because I think a lot of people are discovering Ayurveda through yoga, but I think it's, uh, I want to at least give you an opportunity to make the distinction. Yeah, it's so true. And, and even I came to Ayurveda through yoga, you know, it is, it's kind of how we hear it's like, Oh, there's a workshop or someone's doing a kitchery cleanse or something like that. And then you learn about it in this very sort of like, Oh yeah, it's herbs and diet and routine and rules about season. And it's kind of in this box, you know? And, um, I feel like it's often also described as like a sister science to mm -hmm. yoga. And yeah. to me, I would describe Ayurveda as the mother science to yoga. And, and the reason why is because yoga in and of itself is a vast array of practices and tools that lead to the cultivation of certain qualities and awareness within ourselves, right? So if that that's like a very basic summary of yoga. But how do I know how to modulate those practices and tools for me today? Yoga does not give us that. Ayurveda does, right? So if I'm aware of the energetics of where am I at, what do I need? I know how to modify my asana, my pranayama, my type of meditation, when I do what, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. So for example, with, a, with pranayama, with like a breathing technique, if you are aware of where you are energetically, that might impact the kind of practice that you would adopt on a particular day. So I'm just, Absolutely. I'm actually asking this and not saying it. So there are breathing techniques that I deploy, like the Andrew Wild technique of four, seven, eight. You know, that's more of a grounding meditation or uh, breathwork practice for me um, to calm me down, um, I guess kind of technically to up the carbon dioxide saturation in my blood. Um, but then there's other times when I'm actually looking for more alertness uh, in my life. And so I might adopt a Tumo breath or a Wim Hof style breathing, which is um, more oxygenating and, uh, and kind of spikes, gives you a little epinephrine spike that might make you more alert. So in a way, you're just hacking your autonomic nervous system. But Ayurveda seems to give you the insight into actually which one to do at any particular time. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, and this is the beautiful thing is like, I could say, oh, yes, like, Anulom Bulom has this, Bastrika has this, blah, blah, blah. But even let's just take the two that you're working with. And like you're choosing them because you know the physiological benefits. And so you're reaching for that. But it's really the same. You're saying, where am I at? What do I need? And you have a cerebral understanding of that. But let's say you didn't. If you're feeling dispersed and all over the place and you know that you're needing grounding, right? And Okay, then look at this breath work. It's very clear, super structured. There's no like waviness about it. And because it has that clear structure and the way the times are set up for the breath, it, it has a grounding effect. And you don't need to know the physiology behind that to feel it, right? And if we just look at the qualities, you can understand why that works. Whereas the Wim Hof breath is very heating you know, and it's very stimulating. So it's like a raise that pitta, you know, kind of breath work, which makes sense for what Wim 
does, right? And um, so when we're feeling like we need to be productive, we need to function, we need to produce, we need to do, we need to digest, we need to transform, that's pitta energy that we're really looking to cultivate more of. So to do a breath work that cultivates more of that energy is really a good fit because obviously you're starting in a place where you're not feeling motivated, stimulated, and ready to produce. Mm. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, diet and um, the Ayurvedic diet because so many people have, um, uh, I think, relate Ayurveda to food. And so maybe if you could take a minute to break down kind of how the doshas relate to various taste or, or fa- flavor profiles, et cetera, and, and how, does, how does this all work? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say let's throw those food chart and taste chart. Let's throw that out the window because okay. that is just like this big like, like – you know, like I once had a client that was like, I went and bought everything on the Vata column of the food chart at the grocery store. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because, okay, individual ingredients, when they are combined and when they're alchemized and how we prepare them, it's the end product whose energetics we want to sense. Right. And so very rarely do you have something that's just one taste or just one ingredient and and isn't altered in any way. Right. So that's why those charts are meant to be an understanding of the breakdown. And then you bring it all into the combination. But unless you're a Vaidya, like that's very hard to do for the average person to like figure that out. Right. It's a big puzzle. So what we can figure out is this. Um, what are the qualities of the food? I can sense that. I can sense if it's heavy, if it's light, if it's bitter, if it's sweet, if it's warm, if it's cold, if it's dry, if it's moist. And really that's what I need, right? So when it comes down to the digestive system, there's a few different pieces that we look at in Ayurveda. There's actually first and foremost, your digestive capacity. So before I'm even playing with changing the energetics of your food, I want to know like, how good is your digestive system at digesting? And can I optimize that? Because in Western culture, we blame the food so much and we're not looking at, you know, and even with these food sensitivity tests and things like So often I find clients where they have very restrictive diets because their system is in such a depletion and inflammation or accumulation of toxic buildup or whatever. It's just like very reactive. And then after we really nourish their capacity to digest, that's the first sort of consideration. And the second thing is clean the tube or the health of the tube. You know, is it is it very depleted and dry and weak? Is it very inflamed and infected? Microbiome imbalances, right? And or is it uh, full of a lot of accumulation and buildup of like partially digested, you know, nitrogenized food waste? These are things I want to attend to. And by the way, those that's sort of how I present imbalances in Vata, Pitta, and Kapha house. So depletion, inflammation, accumulation. Like everyone can wrap their head around that, right? So we look at digestive capacity. We look at the tube. We work on those two first. <laughs> then we say, okay, what's going on from your body's signals? What is your body telling us? it wants like how does your poop look how are your digestive symptomatologies how is your appetite how does your tongue look and you don't even need all of those you probably just take two of the four but that's going to give me the feedback of is there are there a lot of signs and symptoms of the depletion of inflammation or accumulation and that's what allows me to attend to what am i going to do to help this person Um, not only clean the tract, but also choose food that is balancing for them. So obviously, if there's a lot of depletion and inflammation together, then I need food that is essentially like what a lot of functional medicine recommends, which is going to be anti-inflammatory in nature and nutrient rich, 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of us are here. You were going to say something? Yeah, I was just wondering, because there's so much self-assessment associated with Ayurveda and self-assessment then leading to self-empowerment and agency. Um, and so I wonder how you feel about, you know, this this kind of explosion within the kind of allopathic system of kind of a personalized medical devices and tools in order to help that self-assessment. And so I'll get specific, like I wear a blood glucose monitor, can't see it because I have a long shirt on, um, but it's a sensor that sits on my tricep that I wave an app at it and I can, for better or worse, have another thing to refresh all day and see how what my blood glucose levels are looking like. Now, I, I do that just because I'm a geek and I'm interested in that right now, um, but I wear an aura ring. Uh, which is primarily focused around uh, monitoring sleep, but also activity and heart rate and heart rate variability. Um, But then there's all of these kind of more sophisticated blood panel uh, trackers like inside tracker and other ones. There's um, obviously you can have your microbiome, the bacteria in your gut tested by sending in a little vial of fecal matter. So I, I, you know, and I, I feel very, um, like those are empowering tools. They can also give you a lot of uh, anxiety if you're too caught up in them. But do you find that some of these kinds of devices and tools are helpful in self-assessment as it specifically pertains to Ayurveda or are they really more distraction? Yeah, I don't find them helpful. I think that... um there's a few different things that I've been seeing with the, this trend, right? And first of all, it's like, look, like until you know how to look at your poop and feel your stomach and feel how food feels in your stomach and really plug into tasting, it, it, like it's a whole new way to approach your relationship with food. And that is not something that can be replaced. And so the other huge confounder is that one of the biggest portals in which all of the energetics from the subtle energetic body come into the physical body is the digestive system. For women, we also have the womb as a second portal, but all humans, it's the digestive system. So what is happening in our lives? Another way to say this might be like how well we're digesting the experience of our lives for me is like 50% of the picture of what I see in people's digestive systems, 50%. Then the remaining 50, I would say split, like 25% is how they're eating. You know, are you taking time to deactivate, like get your parasympathetic on and actually like get ready to receive food? Are you sitting down? Are you driving? Are you in front of a computer? Are you grabbing food while you're feeding kids? You know, are you in a busy space? Are you talking to someone and inhaling your food? Like 25% is just how you're eating. And the remaining 25% is what we're eating. You know, in terms, this is like what I'm noticing as, as what's happening in the patterns of people's digestive systems. So it's very frustrating for a lot of people because they're working so hard to do the FODMAP or to wear monitors or to get tracked or to do this. And then they're like, I'm eating with all the right stuff. And why am I seeing what I'm seeing? And it's like, it's very disheartening for people. And I think all of this technology, it's fun. It's cool. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm really geeking out on bioenergetics myself these days, but it's taking, it's just another, it's the new science removal of awareness. We're not building awareness. We're building knowledge. And there's a difference in that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm. So it's like you have all this more data. Great. You have more data. Does that make you feel really clear about what you need to eat right now? What would feel best for your body to eat right now? And and to remove all already all of the priming that we have from media, culture, family, 
all the diet stuff, all the doctor stuff, like, and all that stuff is wrong and contradictory in some context. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, literally, if you look at every food approach that we have eating for your blood type to paleo, to raw, to vegan, to whatever, there is some context where it's not good for you. And like we have said in science, everything it used to be eat a eat a very low fat diet and high carb. And now it's eat a high fat, low carb diet. And it will keep changing just like the fat of gene styles. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's never going to change, but the truth is, is like, what is good for me in times of travel versus times of stress versus premenstrually versus when I'm pregnant versus menopausally versus in the cold of the winter and versus the hot of the summer is different. And none of that technology is going to teach me how to choose well. Yeah, I often think about how there's two great questions that we simply cannot seem to properly answer as human beings. One, what is the meaning of life? And the other one is what to put in our mouths. <laughs> and the way that you can judge that is just go to the bookstore and see how many thousands of books are on uh, each topic to to demonstrate that it is an absolutely open topic. Um, nobody knows uh, for sure. And I think that, it, you know, Ayurveda seems to address both of those things, both of those questions. Um, but also just democratizes the access to it and the tools um, to it to actually, instead of maybe reading a book about it, maybe answer, help to start to answer those questions for yourself. Absolutely. In the course, we definitely go through, you know, how do you start that awareness of uh, and the assessment of plugging into like what your digestive system is really telling you what you want versus your brain and your shoulds mm -hmm. yeah. you know and, and then um in my app also the it's a free app with the downloadable content i go into some of these things too because i think this is the like happy digestion happy life you know like mm. but your digestive system is the one system like i said where the stuff from the subtle energetic body is coming in and it's also the the one system that is literally taking in everything from your life and your food and processing it and distributing it to provide to every other part of your body, right? And also the digestive system is like the soil, if you will, of the plant of your immune system. So this is why Ayurveda puts so much emphasis on healthy digestion and why there is such a big presence in the sort of food uh, industry. Yeah, I think that metaphor between your gut and the soil is such a good one. And you can Thank even you. map the the physical nature of like the mycelium networks and, and the <laughs> yeah. earthworms and an aerated soil full of microorganisms, et cetera, and growing nutritious, beautiful plants. And your gut, similarly, if you have a, you know, a, a high and diverse population of amazing microbes um, in there, you're going to, um, you're going to have a much happier life with all sorts of good short chain fatty acids and all these other things that I'm into right <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> um, I have to ask you just, you know, I think we're all praying that we move into some kind of general endemicity with COVID. Um, but I wonder if Ayurveda has had some utility during this period of disease and, um, and how you've thought about Ayurveda in the era of COVID and disease. Oh, yes, I'm happy to share. And, you know, obviously this is my personal opinion, et cetera, et cetera, legal disclaimers, but, um, look, like aerosol viruses with a reservoir aren't going anywhere. <laughs> There's no end to yeah. that. And this comes from more of my public health background, right? So different types of viruses have different ways of functioning and operating, and they are tended to by vaccination in different ways. So something like polio is something that was very well suited for a vaccine eradication whereas something with the features of this is just a silly concept 
really. Um, and that's not coming from my father. <laughs> that's the other side of my background. And, you know, um, within this whole experience, the only thing that just is the very clear message, like if we were to ask, like, what's the gift of this experience for everybody? It's the reminder that you can't fake real health. You can't. If you're eating processed foods, if you're living a high stress lifestyle, if you're not happy, you're not getting enough sleep, guess where it's going to show? Your immunity, you, you know, your digestion. It, it's right away. And, you know, if you're not exercising, it's just the basics for living a healthy lifestyle, you're going to have crappy immunity and you're going to be more susceptible to all of the different variants of microbes that are out there in our ever-changing world that are never going anywhere. They will be here past us. So I think that was the real gift because we needed that correction, I think, as a human population. Like we're really so caught up in supplements and trying to just like band-aid or this that sort of statin example that we gave earlier where we're exogenously trying to, you know, counteract the effects of modern urban life it doesn't work so you know i really feel like for me i we we were fine my whole family was fine because we're doing things we're living in a way to support our immunity and i have had covid and when i caught it it was very obvious what i was doing to deplete myself i was traveling working long hours and a deadline not with access to my kitchen and my usual foods, eating out a lot, like, you know, um, in some high stress situations. And it, it was very clear that opportunity comes and the bugs are all around no matter what you're doing. And um, my experience of it was very light because I knew how to attend to it. I have it I've had it twice. And even my mother who is overweight, does have pre-diabetic sort of things, has high blood pressure and is elderly, um, but she's not someone who lives a lifestyle that I would say has all those basics in place super well, despite many years of my nagging. Um, <laughs> really, uh, she, you know, we got in there and I, I remember flying in from London when I found out she had COVID Within three days, she had turned around and I went to the pharmacy and got her all the six prescriptions that her doctor said, because she has very different viewpoints on things. And it was like, they're here. If you want them, they're here. Any of this. She's like, no, I want to try this naturally. And just with using herbs and diet and, you know, like bringing in the opposite qualities, she was up and at it in three days. So, you know, it took her, we made her rest for a lot longer than that, but that's not the experience I think she would have had, had she, had she not approached it Ayurvedically or been supported Ayurvedically. Right. So when people ask me like, well, what is your protocol for, for Ayurveda? I'm like, okay, first live in a way that supports your immunity. But second, you know, the second you feel any symptoms, you want to really support your respiratory system. And you really want to support your digestive system because that's your immunity. So cancel everything, sleep as much as you can, warm salt baths, um, you know, all of that good stuff to just like calm down the sympathetic nervous system. So it's not in the way as we're supporting the respiratory and the digestive systems. Right. And then with the respiratory systems, there's so many beautiful uh, herbs in Ayurveda and practices um, uh, aroma wise and also in tea form and, and or capsule form. And then digestively, it's going to be all about um, really all the foods that don't over labor the system because we know digestive capacity is lowered as the body's trying to fight off an infection, but have high nutritive value that are very antioxidant that improve digestive capacity and keep it light and easy. For the system mm. yeah i absolutely agree with you obviously there's been a tremendous amount of pain and suffering endured um, across the spectrum but if there is some sort of gift or silver lining it's that 
you know, we just need to pay attention to the ground conditions of our personal health. And, um, yeah, I mean, you make that great point of, well, your digestion, your gut is just like six microns away from your 80 or 70 percent of your immune system. And that makes total sense. That says the way it should be because your immune system is always tweaking and that's the place it would be uh, most have greatest rapport or relationship with things ex exogenously coming into your body. So, you know, you're digesting your food and your immune system is right there. Um, and if your digestion is out of balance or your gut is in dysbiosis or even for me, I had intestinal permeability for a while just because I wasn't as mindful as I am now about what I eat and I overconsumed NSAIDs and PPIs and all these or things that I thought were anti-inflammatory that ended up turning to be inflammatory in my life. Um, and, uh, and now I pay greater attention to that, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that some of the attention can go on, to practices and sciences like Ayurveda and also, you know, just living a, uh, a life that's in greater alignment with nature in general um, to try to improve those ground conditions of our health. Um, I mean, you know, the coronavirus was in this strange, I don't want to call it a Goldilocks zone because that has a positive connotation but almost this anti goldilocks so and i think if it was a virus that had a mortality rate that you know 10x it would have been a very very different story but what it seemed to do was put a microscope on to society as it already was and so it seemed to impact people that had poor health i mean obviously you look at like the mortality correlation to people that have multiple comorbidities or metabolic syndrome etc and um and you can see right there that you know this is just what it's really doing is pulling back the curtain on a problem that's already been there in our society so um oh you know you mentioned something that i just wanted to share with the audience and you mentioned people that have multiple comorbidities and uh, I just thought it would be nice to share with people, you know, I'm presenting Ayurveda as this very like sentient practice of being in tune with where you're at and what you need and attending to that. And, you know, um, I don't want to maybe misrepresent it as like soft in its healing capacity because when I first started practicing Ayurveda, I think because I had the MD and all the letters behind my name, I attracted a lot of people that were so fed up with their chronic degenerative diseases and had multiple diseases. And oh my God, the results I've seen with multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's. Um, I myself had, um, had several of these diagnoses, um, you know, really um, getting people off of their meds was sort of my claim to fame for the first five years of my practice. And not that that's what I intended to do, that's what they wanted. And, and what we did was we worked in concert with their doctors because I don't practice any Western medicine. It's legally way too dangerous for me to do that. So I'm fully under the house of Ayurveda. And um, I think that there's a huge opportunity for more of that work where we can. So what we would do is I would educate and empower them and I would work on the awareness of the energetics of their lives and their choices and how they were propagating disease. And then I would secondarily also bring in a bunch of natural tools to attend to their specific patterns and disorders and symptoms. And then as we watched them change how they're operating in life and the energetics they're curating they're you know we're cultivating the energetics of our lives in our choices and as we watch the effects of all of the natural sort of uh remedies and and things that we brought in we saw shifts in 
in their symptoms. And we use this to then have them proactively go back to the doctor's office, demand rediagnosis, rework labs, and um, wean them off of their medications. And it was really interesting. I mean, I've seen this so many times over with so many different cases and so many different reactions from the doctors. At the end, despite their resistance and hesitation, the reaction always came down to how the hell did you do that? And, um, you know, like, oh, I have goosebumps. It, one of even a case that I didn't even think was going to happen. Um, I had a 73 year old woman who was on 150 micrograms of thyroid hormone who had been on it for over 50 years. And she came in saying, well, every woman in my family has this. It's just a genetic thing. We we're all low thyroid. Well, and I remember what I said to her, which was apparently what made her decide to be my client. I said, well, every woman in your life is probably running in an empty tank and thinks it's normal. <laughs> and I was right, you know, and um, because that's the energetic pattern underlying that. And um, it's, it's not a coincidence that one in four women is taking thyroid hormone these days in America, like, and it, the stats are probably higher now. And uh, this woman who is at an age where you don't think there's a lot of rejuvenative capacity left in the body. And with 50 years of a dependence, like you don't expect an organ to just come back like that. And it's in, it was a really interesting journey, but it was a year and a half. And it was also very fascinating because her labs lagged behind her feeling in her body by like three months, hmm. which was super, I'd never seen that before. But in a year and a half, Jeff, she was down to 25 micrograms. Like, that's huge. Um, she was thrilled. Amazing. So, so what's possible with Ayurveda and with these things, even though it seems like a very light sort of spiritual thing, um, it's a force. It's really powerful healing. Yeah. Well, e even for folks that just are new to Ayurveda, but have adopted this notion that food is medicine, that there are phytonutrients and polyphenols and all of these other compounds in what we put into our body and or other people that may have adopted a meditation practice because they have so much anxiety and stress in their lives. Well, we all know now that there's knock-on physiological impacts connected to the psychological impacts of stress. So all of this, again, as you say, this is, this is a science, a, a wisdom of life. And, um, and the more, uh, I think the more that we can understand it and apply it, um, the more human flourishing there will be. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this interview from the Commune podcast, then I think you'll love this video right here. It's not that there is one single diet, dietary brand that we have made up that is clearly unanimously the best and the most optimal diet that everyone has to eat for good health. There are a number of different ways.